first person I'd like to call up is Ruvain Lavavi. Ruvain is a principal advisor and founder of Power Forward Group. If you give him a round of applause, Ruvain. Some of my clients beseech Ruvain's advice for financial advisement. Thank you for joining us. You can get any seat you want. Our next panel is our next panel member is Saul Friedman. Founder from Saul and Friedman and co CPA. I can tell you I've probably done hundreds of millions of dollars worth of SBA transactions with the with the help of Saul Friedman. Over 50 years experience. Each one of his clients get a personalized attention. Please give a round of applause for Saul Friedman. Achrin Achrin Chaviv, Aaron Pinson, CFA, founder, Equinum Wealth Management. I've personally benefit, uh, benefited from his advice. Yes. But not just for him, please give our panel a round of applause. Thank you very much. We're going to open up the panel for questions. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw it out. In the meantime, what do you think? all right, watch my drink. I don't know. Okay, I just want to, I'm calling up the moderator now. This, this is a moderated discussion. Oh. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of, of this panel came, we had a brainstorm meeting for this event. And by the meeting, one of the CHY Founder Circle members, Ari Marinovsky said, let's never heard a good discussion on wealth, building wealth. Let's do something along those lines. And I said, that's a great idea. And so really, the, the idea of this panel comes right out of the mind of Ari Marinovsky, and Ari is a very thoughtful person, and we're going to ask him to moderate the discussion tonight. So Ari Marinovsky. All the mics are, where's the sound guy? Sound guy? All the mics that they have while their seats are working? Ask your mics, please. Testing. Testing. Is that good? All right. Let's get rolling. It's 10:15. Um, the, the the first thing I want to say, as just an introductory comment, is uh, number one, where's the B and H guy to to shut everybody up? He did a great job. Um, he left. The first thing I want to say is, is obviously the way that you're going to build the most wealth, I think we all know this, is what you do in your day job. The purpose of this discussion is hopefully you've, you've done something well at your day job that you have a little bit of extra money left over after you've given Sadaka and given to CHYE. And, and the, the purpose of this discussion is what to do with that money. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, put that money to good use and, and, and build wealth uh, for our families, etc. The, the second uh, sort of disclaimer that I want to make is um, that we are, the, the profile, and this is really for the panel members, the profile of the people that we want to discuss right now are CHYE, our young people, young entrepreneurs who have a long uh, investing horizon. We want to uh, be at this for a long time. So with all that as preamble, the, the first topic or the first you know, discussion point that I want to bring up is right now, today, you know, from an amateur's perspective, you look at, you know, the market and you look at the world, you see asset prices are super high, you know, the market's gone crazy since COVID, the, the government printed a ton of money, real estate prices are super high, Bitcoin is super high, Pokemon cards are super high. Where the heck should we put our money? And I'll, I'll start with the, the senior, uh, number one, nice, nice to meet you guys, uh, Amari. Uh, well, I guess we'll start with you, Saul, the most experienced. By, w uh, excuse me. By way of introduction, it's very interesting. I was just looking at the panelists. 
the other two panelists are going to tell you what to do with your money. And I think all you're going to hear from me tonight is what not to do with your money. Um, I've been in the business world now for over 50 years, and we've come through a few cycles. I call them dips. Some of them were severe. And uh, you learn your lesson, what not to do. I remember years ago, I was um, uh, speaking to a potential client, and he told me something very interesting. He says, the reason I want to hire you is because I don't want to learn from my mistakes. I want to learn from your clients' mistakes. So if you have some um, experience in the business world and you've seen what people have done successfully and what people have done and it hurt them, um, you would probably turn to somebody like me because of my years and years of watching how these things work. So uh, by way of introduction, whenever uh, I'm going to be asked the question what I should invest in, I'm going to tell you I'm not an investment advisor. For that, you have the esteemed gentleman here. Uh, if you're going to ask me what not to do, and to be careful, then you'll hear me say something. Otherwise, I'll be quiet. What should we not do? Well, let's hear what they tell you to do, and then I'll tell you what not to do. All right, so now I'm set up, right? Absolutely. We got NFTs over here. I heard cryptocurrency over there. I heard real estate over there. They're all good. So there's not one answer, right? So A, diversification. B, comfort. And those work together at all times. There's no one answer. Financial advisor tells you, hey, what stocks will return what X, Y, and Z? They don't know. But if you diversify your portfolio and are consistent about it, you're going to be okay. But the question is about being comfortable from where you come from, right? What's your money story? Where do you come from? How do you come into that money story? And that really is your background, right? What did you grow up with and what's your background? So Sal, you mentioned you've been through some down markets. You'll tell people what not to invest in. No, I'm not going to tell them what not to invest in. I'm going to tell them what not to do. What not to do. Everybody should invest. And I won't tell you what not to invest in. What I will tell you, let me give you a start. What I have found in the last 20 years, a lot of the young people go into specific industries. The majority of them go into real estate, nursing homes, dealing with Amazon. Let's use these. Um, these three things. And the tendency is, especially with the first two, with the real estate and the nursing home industry, when they flip something or they sell something and they, major, they make a huge profit, what do you think they do with the money? Buy so the real estate. estate guy takes the money he made and buys more real estate. The nursing home guy, he's not happy with five nursing homes. He sold two at a huge profit, he buys 10 more. He's putting everything back into where he is. And I keep on pleading with everybody that you have to be able to take money off the table. In other words, not everything has to have an IRR of 20, 25%. Take some money and park it in a good mutual fund, in a good stock portfolio, maybe some treasuries, maybe some municipals, put it away, even if it doesn't earn more than 5 8%. In case there is a dip in the market that we cannot foresee, such as COVID, those that got hurt, at least you have money put away, you don't get wiped out. People in the past, in the 90s, that bought real estate, heavily leveraged, when it came crashing, they were wiped out. They became cash register attendants. That's what happened with them, because they didn't have any money put aside. That's what you're going to hear from me all night. I'm pleading with everybody, especially in today's times, where we don't know where we're going, exactly what to do so you don't get wiped out if there's something bad happens in the marketplace. 
I, I would take a different angle entirely to the question, and it's going to preface by saying that before someone like myself, before someone like myself speaks to a large Hello? crowd, before someone, before someone like myself speaks to a large crowd, you normally have a disclaimer which says, don't take this as an investment advice, use it for entertainment purposes only or informational purposes only. And the reason why we do that is because no two people are alike. There could be some, someone sitting here that's retired, living off their investments. Someone on the other side could be just starting to invest. And most of the people are somewhere in between. And every person is different. So when someone asks you, oh, what should I invest? Earlier today, someone asked me in Shul, it was Mincha, and they asked me, oh, what do you think about Shopify? It's down so much, is it a good place to invest? Well, I don't know, well, what's your situation? What are you doing with your life? Where are you? So it's not as if a financial advisor should be pushing anything to you. They should be listening, understanding, trying to put themselves in your shoe, where you are in your journey, and based off of that, yeah, you find specific places, obviously through diversification, obviously not through compounding and putting everything back into the place you generated the wealth from initially. But the first answer is always going to be, it depends. Great. That was helpful. I should use this mic? Okay. So, the... No? Not use it? That, that makes sense. The U.S. government printed a ton of money over the past two years, and uh, I, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, it's, I, I read somewhere that like 80% of the money in circulation was printed over the past few years. Um, we all see inflation in our our day-to-day -day lives. I think it's hovering right now at seven percent, seven and a half percent. But it, it's hard to understand what does that mean uh, for investors. It, it makes things very, very scary. What, what can you make of inflation and what actions should we take as a result of it? So now, now I'm stuck being first every time now. <laughs> um, okay, so, so inflation is, is, is a tricky question. Um, obviously, the biggest issue with inflation, technically speaking, is any long-duration asset, whether it's a long-duration bond, a long-duration stock, a long-duration business, where you're expecting a lot to come five years down the road, ten years down the road, and you're expecting a lot to be valued today, higher inflation, higher discount rate, it's worth a lot less. So that's why asset prices fall when inflation goes up. Any good portfolio manager should be worried about inflation, should be tilting their portfolios to try to adjust into different areas where inflation won't hurt the portfolio that much or even specific asset classes where they do well during inflationary environments. And I will say that the 7% number is definitely a, a shock type of number, but it's a year-over-year -year metric, so you can expect it to come down very strongly, probably even in the next two quarters, but then especially when you're looking 2023 over 2022, it will definitely be coming down, so you shouldn't expect 7% inflation moving forward. But having said that, you need to change your portfolios around. So in fixed income, that means shorter duration instruments instead of longer duration, or floating rate bonds. In equities, instead of buying high-flying tech stocks that are all being valued on what they're going to do in 2030 or 2035, which again is a long duration type of asset that gets knocked down when you have higher inflation expectations, you buy more stable companies, more stable industries that are making more of their money today, not so much pie in the sky future. Right, so value companies over growth companies is a big change with inflation, but I think the biggest thing is what's the projection, right? Is it two quarters, is it three quarters, is this really here to stay? Um, and that's a question of where the government goes on an interest rate basis. I think that's what we're all thinking about. There's a lot of real estate investors here. There's a lot of people who use leverage. Are interest rates gonna go up? They're going up by how much are they going to go up, and is that here to stay? Uh, and that's a question that's going to be seen. There's very few levers the government can use. They're hoping interest rates can help. But if you think about it from a political spectrum, what's pushing the government not to raise rates? We have more U.S. citizens retiring every single day, and they have all their money in safe out. They have all their money in their 401k and S&P 500. They can't get safe yield on their money. They would 
many of them would love to take their money out of the market, put their money in bonds, CDs, assets like that, that will give a nice rate of return. Interest rates go up, those assets may have a better return. The question is, will the government allow them to do that and where are rates going, I think is what we're all thinking about. So it's, inflation is one thing, but it's really the question is where are rates going and where is that gonna take us on our portfolio management? And for any of us to predict is very hard to do. So you wanna make sure you have a balanced portfolio. You don't wanna be all in high flying tech stocks. You want a diversification in your equity portfolio. I'd like to answer this question from a different point of view. Uh, previous panelists have been talking about what kind of investments to make to hedge against inflation. I want to talk to a businessman that has a business. Maybe he's in his uh, owner-occupied real estate. Let's assume he's selling widgets. Doesn't make a difference. And in inflationary times, what this businessman should do to help him weather the inflationary financial picture. So it's not the question what he should invest in, the question is what he should do with his business in order to be able to um, assist him and not, not uh, having any negative effects from inflation. One of the things that we're doing in our own firm, uh, we occupy an office building. I have a fixed rate mortgage with a swap that's coming due in two years. I know there's a large prepayment penalty, but being that we're in inflationary times and interest rates are gonna go up, we contacted the bank and we said, we'd like to renew our loan, get another 10 year loan, maybe take out some money over and above what we owe and pay the prepayment penalty, which is heavy. But at least I'll get the opportunity to fix my rates for 10 years. Because when you're in business and you're in owner occupied building, you're not here to play the market. You hear you want a stable environment, you want stable interest rates. And people that have this type of situation, a good thing for them to do now, if they only have a few years to go, a year or two or even three, to go and refinance now and fix the rates for the next 10 years or 15 years if they can do it. Likewise, if you have a term loan with the bank, you try to renew it, and try to fix the rates again, if you can. Most of the lines of credits are based on a floating rate, based on prime, so you can borrow at prime. I just want to remind the people, I don't think anybody in this room was born when the prime rate was 22.5%. That's 22.5% was the prime rate. And if you borrow at a two over prime, which was standard then, the regular rate in business was 24.5%. I don't think there's any businesses that finance their receivables or inventory or both that could withstand that kind of interest. Now you might say to me, ah, this will never ever happen. How can that happen? Even seven and a half, uh, the gentleman here said seven and a half percent, it's gonna drop in two quarters. You never know what happens. There could be a war in Ukraine, and you can be uh, lines in for, for gas, gasoline, it can be anything, and rates can go up. So try to protect yourself with your borrowings in your business, in owner-occupied properties, and try to refinance and set the rate again. If you talk about people that are in the real estate business, that's really very scary because people drop like cap rate, 4%, 5% cap rate, 6% cap rate. What happens when interest rates go up to 9%? The way you leverage, you almost get all, all of you get wiped out. So you, in times like this, you have to be careful not to over leverage what you have because 
if you're working on a floating rate or even if you even if you're on a fixed rate people say to me well what do i have to worry about i have a 10 year fixed fixed rate at 5 4% so what do i have to worry if interest rates go up i have a fixed rate there's two problems with that one problem is that when it's going to come to refinance based on your NOI, on your income, you're not going to be able to get what you got before. If you want to sell it, you think that you're going to be able to get a five cap or a six cap, but if the guy has to go out and get financing then, it's going to turn into a, a 10 cap. That's what you're going to get. So you can get hurt either way. So this is very dangerous times for people that are in the real estate business. But I'm referring to somebody who's an owner-occupied, he's not here to sell, he's not here to move out, he here wants to stay, fix the interest rates, whatever you can. Got it. Fix rates. So, switching gears for a second. Obviously, you know, stocks, bonds, real estate, these, these are all considered safe investments. Today, there's some alternative uh, investments that have become very popular, specifically cryptocurrencies, you mentioned NFTs, but also things like gold, things like luxury watches. I read recently that the price of a Rolex outpaced the S&P 500 over the past 10 years. So if you, if you bought a Submariner in, in like 2008 for like four grand, now it's worth like 30. What, what do you feel about alternatives like gold, like watches, like crypto? And for the young investor that understands that these are speculative but could still do very well, how much of them, if any, should we keep in our portfolio? So my quick answer is only trade in alternatives if you understand the alternative. Most of my clients understand crypto better than me. I don't trade in crypto, but if you want to invest in alternatives, you treat it like any other investment. You decide what your asset class is, the underlying alternative asset classes, and your dollar cost average a certain percentage of your portfolio into it. Now, if somebody understands NFTs, understands NFTs, he could trade in NFTs. If somebody here understands watches at a level that I don't, they work on 47th Street, yeah, that's your living, trade in watches. Same thing with cryptocurrency. If you understand it to a level that I don't understand and you really think you have an in, that becomes a business. But at the end of the day, if it's part of your portfolio, this is my alternative asset class. I'm going to invest in this alternative asset class. And what percentage of my portfolio does that exist in? So we started with diversification, so we'll stick with it. But I just want to mention the 7.5%. That, so, so, so the business we have is a little tricky. My job as a portfolio manager is to tilt portfolios in a specific way based on our expectations. If you don't, then you're not doing anything and you're not doing what's best for the client. So you have to have predictions, you have to have assumptions and expectations. But together with that, our job is to diversify and not assume and put everything in and say, oh, we know inflation is going to go down, so we're betting all on one side to say, hey, you know what, inflation is going to uh, subside. We're going to invest with diversification as much as we can and try to, you know, put the risks out there where, hey, you know what, there's a risk of, you know, running out of money. There's a risk of the client not reaching their goals. There's a risk of inflation. There's a risk of, of, of not hitting, you know, a specific me benchmark or metric. It's understanding where all those risks are and then, you know, uh, putting your portfolio down in that place where we have the best a probability to hit those goals, to hit those achievements. So obviously we have to make assumptions on interest rates, on, 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 on things subsiding as well. Um, with, regards to, with regards to alternative investments, it's the same thing. I, with alternative investments? So it's an interesting report I just read as an example. You have to assume Bitcoin, this was actually interesting, is a JP Morgan report that came out and reverse engineered the return requirement in the Bitcoin space and Bitcoin currency to have the same sharp ratio in a portfolio. So every, you know, again, we're not, we're, not, we're not drawing on whiteboards here, but obviously a job as a portfolio manager is to try to say, hey, you know what, we're going to make the highest level of return for that equal level of risk. So if we're willing to go down the risk spectrum, the return is going to come down. But if I can get the same risk level and get a higher return, then obviously I'm going to go for that portfolio. Now, 
if Bitcoin is going to enter your portfolio, you have to have, even if it's just 2% of your portfolio into Bitcoin, you have to expect to make 26% return in that asset, or else you're adding extra volatility without getting the return required for it. So again, these are, things, these are all things that we consider when we're creating a portfolio. We look at all the metrics, all the different data points that we can bring in to see, hey, you know what, is this an asset class that will bring added value? Most alternative asset classes, even if they have a lower expected return, a lot of hedge funds is a perfect example. Some hedge funds, 5-6% is your expected return. Why would you do 5-6% if you are, you know, you can make 10% in stocks? Or in private equity where you can make closer to 15 or 20%. But because it comes with a lower re uh, level of volatility, and because that brings the overall swings and probabilities of your portfolio to much more concentrated, lower swings and much more concentrated where you know what your return is going to be with a, a greater level of confidence. So adding alternative investments to portfolio tends to do very, very well for the overall portfolio. I'd like to accomplish two things with this answer. Uh, you heard the uh, Menasha Horowitz speak and he said a very important thing um, and I know it's 100% true. I've been, I, my firm has been associated with B&H since 1976. So we're almost going, you know, with 45, 46 years. So I know how they think. He said something which is very important. You have to focus. A, a human being is a human being, and he can only do so much. It can't be all over. Now, I'm talking from the perspective of a business person who has extra money for him to invest. What he shouldn't do is handle the investments himself. He doesn't have to know the volatility of the market and the inflation rates and the curves and all those things because then he's going to lose focus on his own business. And he should go out and get a good wealth manager, a good financial advisor to do. If he trusts him, uh, the people that I work with, I say, they always call me because I guess they have to tape it. Uh, I want to invest X dollars in this and this hedge fund. It does this, it does that, whatever. I say to him, why are you wasting my time? You think it's good? I trust you. At the end of the day, how do I measure whether you're doing a good job? It's not by the phone calls that you're calling me. Let's see how you do. You beat the market or you're as good as the market, you're fine. So I'm giving a plug to wealth managers because if you're in business selling widgets, concentrate on selling widgets. Don't try to outsmart the market. Don't try to do things which is going to take your focus away from your business. Go to a good wealth manager, a good, we used to call them stockbrokers, financial advisors. Go to them. You trust them. Give them the money. He talks to you. He sees your degree of risk. So you can do the way I do it. I said, I'm investing X dollars. It should be semi, uh, you know, uh, not treasury bills, some risk. And here, here, put away X amount of dollars. Here's $100,000. I call that play money. If I lose it, I lose it. Now you can buy Bitcoin if somebody will explain that to me. And if I would understand it, maybe I would say, okay, let's do it. I don't understand it, so I don't even have any opinions. But go to a good financial advisor and let him worry about your money and, and you not lose focus on your business. That's very important. Oh, that's no great... charge for the plug. So let me, let me push back on that a bit and, and challenge these two guys. Well, obviously very, very smart, but they're subject to human error and emotions and, and all the other things that could happen you know, when, when a person is pushing the button. Recently, what became is very popular is the uh, concept of robo-investing, where it's basically you create a portfolio of a mixed amount of assets and you set a certain risk tolerance and you press play and it goes. And, and honestly, that's been my experience. That's what I invested in. There's a company called Betterment that does it. I don't use them anymore. There's Charles Schwab has an intelligent portfolio. It's a company called Wealthfront that also does it. And basically, it, it takes all the human error out of decision making, where humans can be emotional. I can freak out one day and sell all my stuff, and you know, I, then what am I going to do? So hang on. Um, 
So why should we trust the humans over the machines in this case? So, so the errors that you would accomplish by doing that are errors of which, once you set the asset classes correctly, so that's an assumption, that you pick the right portfolio that you're going to stick to. And the error of rebalancing, selling a little bit of the stocks, buying the bonds, or some of the alternative investments that may be in those portfolios, so sure. But the biggest error individual investors have is selling when things don't look good. So during COVID, let's say, the stock market was down 35%. If you had a better mint then, not you specifically, hopefully you held the course and maybe even bought more. But a lot of investors, factually, because that's why stocks were down, people were selling and running over, tripping over themselves to continue to sell. They sold as things went. So they closed their Betterment account and maybe started, I don't know, trading uh, some other, maybe the watches you're talking about. But they sold out of, out of stocks entirely. Or same thing when things are doing great. You know, they'll, they'll add money at the wrong times. So there's two parts to that again. Number one is setting up the plan initially. What type of allocation? What are the goals? Think about financial planning. So I, I deal in our firm, I'm the, the CFA. I deal with portfolio construction, management of the money. My partner who's here today, Yanki Halberstam, he's, thank you, Benjamin. He's, the, he, he's, he's a CFP, a certified financial planner. So he does a lot of the planning parts initially to figure out how much is needed to save, how to set up that initial savings plan, analyze the life insurance, analyze, you know, estate plan, all the other parts of it. It's not just about rebalancing a portfolio like a robo would do and say, oh, you know what, the stock market went up a little bit, now let's sell down. Our 70% allocation went to 75, let's sell it back to 70 and move to bonds. You know, setting up the plan initially and then holding hands with clients during tough times, sticking to the plan, updating the plan, what to do with it for things like that. So everything's an opportunity. We love robo-advisors. Uh, Betterman came out. The first thing we did, we said, hey, that's a wonderful tool. It's wonderful for our clients. It's wonderful for us. We ran over. Everything's negotiable. We said, hey, can we work with you guys? So we believe in one motto. Technology is wonderful. Technology powered by advisors is even better. Uh, Charles Schwab intelligent portfolios, right? Automated portfolios. Every time the market drops by a 10% margin, the Schwab call center gets inundated. People are calling to so worry about their intelligent portfolio. What do you think half those people do if they don't get an answer? They sell, right? What's a financial advisor's job? It's to coach a client through that scenario via the initial plan, via the CFP to say, hey, what is my safety net? What am I comfortable investing? And what am I comfortable with in a down market cycle? If you set that on the initial stage and then you use a robo-advisor because it's the cheapest platform to invest with and it fits the client's comfort, you've achieved two goals. You've achieved it achieved super cheap investing, you've achieved automation, you've achieved rebalancing, you've made the firm's life, the financial planner's life easier. And as long as you know that client's comfortable with, let's call it $50,000 in the bank. Now, beginning of COVID, market's off 15, 20%. You call all your clients and you say, hey, remember when we discussed $50,000 in the bank? What do you have now? And if the client says, oh, I have 150K, what are we doing? We're investing at least 100000 in that because now we have an opportunity if the client's young enough. If the client's at that margin or lower, you haven't done your job because they've overinvested, they've overextended. But at the bottom line, robo is wonderful. Simplicity, ease of investment is wonderful. If your financial advisor is not making your job easier to invest, they're not doing their job. Putting all this aside, what is the job of a financial advisor? The financial advisor is supposed to move people. Right? My job is to move a client to get further along whatever their financial goal is. That's it, simply put. In that initial meeting, uncovering what that comfort level is to move you along to your goal, once we have that, we have to invest along those lines. That's all we gotta do. I, I would like to answer this question, again, pertaining to businesses and a topic that we didn't discuss yet, and that's taxes. A lot of people make decisions based on what they perceive the, t the tax picture to be. Let me give you an example. When uh, President Trump lost the election, lost in quotes, people came to me and said, you know, Biden proposed 
that capital gains rates are going to go up even higher than ordinary uh, rates. 39.6 plus 2.5, like 42%. So maybe now we should sell off whatever stocks we have, whatever real estate we have, in order to get the cheaper half price of capital gains. Now, I'm not giving financial advice. I'm not even giving tax advice because I, I don't know what's going to happen. But this is also a major point in how people make investments. So what do I answer? I usually answer the question, we don't know what's going to happen in 2021. We don't know if the new rates are going to change, if, if, the, this, if uh, they'll be able to get through the tax package that they have. I wouldn't worry about it. Sit with it. If you plan to sit with it, sit with it anyway. You can't play the market. Now, those people that sold off properties, we're talking in, uh, in, in 2020, sold off properties because of the election, wound up, there were no changes in the tax laws in 2021. And if people ask me, I'll tell them there's not going to be any changes in 2022 either in the tax code. Capital gains rates won't change. Ordinary income tax rates won't change. Um, so a kind of a question like this, what to do concerning taxes, to answer your question, why don't I go out and buy a tax program for $39, take the information that I have for my business, plug it in there, and it's going to tell you what to do. It's going to even project. We have, I saw tax packages that are projecting that the following year capital gains rates will be double. Because that's somebody plugged that in. It doesn't work like that. You have to work with feeling. You have to, uh, a machine cannot do what you can do. You can use a machine to help you, but it can't do what you can do. So if I have an opinion that I'm not going to be worried about, I have time to worry about it at that time. Uh, because I always said in capital gains, it's usually never retroactively. And if he passes, if we see that something is going to be passed in June, so you tell him in April, May, sell it. You know, I, I don't have to worry about it. So a machine will never, ever replace the human feeling that you have. You know the situation. You can read between the lines. You can have 10 studies that are going to tell you what the inflation rate is going to be. And you, you uh, predicted it. And that in 2023, it's going to come back down. You know, what it, that's what you said. I have a two-year-old Anikl. If I ask him what he thinks about the inflation rates, and he's going to go with his head down, that means it's going down. With his head up, means it's going up. It's just as reliable as the New York Times making a prediction what it's going to be. Thank you. You guys should give him some commission. Um, some, you know, quick question. It's something that I, I always wondered about. I just recently started getting to real estate. The first things that I invested in were stocks, and then so maybe I guess you know real estate via not not buying real estate myself, but via syndicated real estate deals where one guy you know is buying the deal and he raises some money. Um, and recently, that's been sort of my investment of choice. I'm, I'm curious a few things. Number one, it seems like Jews in general are more favored to real estate uh, over the stock market, and I'm curious if you have any idea of why that is, and, and, and maybe it's taxes, maybe it's 1031, maybe it's you know depreciation, all that sort of stuff. But the other thing that I noticed is in real estate, everybody uses leverage. Everybody uses debt. Everybody borrows money. Everybody puts down 20% on a property and then borrows the rest from the bank. But no one really does that in stocks. People, if, if anything, use very, very little margin. Um, and I recently saw, like on Robinhood, you can borrow money on margin at like 3%. It was recently like 2.5%. My question is, if real estate and stocks are both considered safe investments, why is one using tons of debt and, and therefore getting much more returns, and one is you know, borrowing on margin is considered to be unsafe and risky. 
I have a very quick answer to that. The difference is, if, if, you, if you borrow against real estate, let's say 60% of value, and something goes wrong, you're not personally responsible, usually, for the 60%. So you only lost your investment. In the stock market, you're personally responsible for everything. It's backed by stocks, but on the other hand, if even stocks wind up short, you're personally responsible for it. That's a major difference between the two. Right, so, so to me, the biggest key, I mean, there's, a, there's several answers, and that's for sure a good answer as well. The biggest key um, is that stocks price every second of every day, and the volatility that's there, with the leverage that's there, Again, just think, go back to COVID. There was a 35% correction in 25 days, give or take. 35%, the S&P 500, small cap indexes, even, even more than 35% down. If you had leverage anywhere close to 50%, you were entirely, the, the brokerage firm that you had that margin with would have sold all your stocks on the way down and would have left you with zero. Uh, if you're buying individual stocks, even worse. Some of them are marginal, some of them are not. And if you, you interact with brokers, one day could wake up and increase your margin rates in some of the stocks. So because it's extremely liquid and because it prices every single day, just the logistics of how it's done and how you could, you know, again, real estate, sure, it's there. Nobody's coming to you, oh, your, your, house, your house just fell 50% or your building just fell 23%. I'm sure in COVID, if you wanted to sell a building, you would have had to do that. You know, go, go, even, even a year later in, in Manhattan, there's plenty of buildings that are, are, you know, drawn down that much. But the banks don't benefit by evicting people and doing things. So you're not going to be forced to sell when things go down. So that, in my mind, is probably the biggest, the biggest thing is where just the ease of, the, of brokerages to say, hey, you know what, look, we're capped there and we could force you to sell. Or even those emotions that we spoke about earlier, when, you, when your margin just doubles it. So it's just risky because all of a sudden you see you're down 20%. Even this, this last month with the market down 10%, using leverage, you would have been down 20. You could have used those emotions against you in the wrong way. So Yeah. I think all of the above, I think both of you agree with you guys completely. Um, I think at a baseline, everybody here is here because they're successful, right? And everything we do is make a deal. If you're buying a margin, the house is a brokerage account, right? You're, you're doubling down on one account. You're doubling down with the house. You don't, own, you don't control any side of that deal. You're borrowing money from the house and that you're investing with the house. Right? They have all your cards. Now, if you want to use leverage, if you're using leverage for real estate, if you're using leverage for any type of investment, the beauty of it is negotiating the deal. You get your line of credit from wherever you get your line of credit. If you have a market account, you can get a leverage line of credit backed now by the market at above a million dollars. You can look at lines at one and a quarter, 1.8%, beautiful lines, right? If you buy more equity, you're still buying more equity with the house. But if you go take that line and figure out a deal with a bank, or if you're buying real estate, you're controlling one leg of the deal, you have more control of that leg of the deal. So now you're bringing yourself into the picture. And that's our job, right? Our job is to negotiate the best deal for ourselves. And the only way you can do that is putting yourself in the picture. So if you're buying more of the same, and if you're betting double down the house, that's what the house wants you to do, right? The house wants you to split the cards. The house wants you to stay at the table. The longer they can keep you at the table, the more money you're gonna lose the more addicted you're gonna become. So you gotta look for ways around that. And that's what we do, we speak to clients about ways to leverage out their accounts. If you wanna invest in real estate, that's great. We're not gonna help you invest in real estate, but we're gonna help you build out your market account to leverage for real estate. If you wanna invest in your business, you can use leverage for that. You control the business account, right? You control the way you're operating your business. You have more security in that account. So can you control the way you're using the line of credit there? Then you're not doubling down on your risk. You're using the benefit of one account to supplement something that you're controlling. So it's just, to, at the bottom line, it's a modicum of control. If you're controlling the deal, then you're still a business owner. You're still in a position of power. Once you give up control, you're done. And that's all margin is. It's a way to give up control to buy more and double down. So is there even a small bit of margin? Any margin is considered safe? We got a response. Uh, you triggered something in my mind. Are there any people, you, you talked about real estate syndications, I want to say something about that. Uh, is there anybody here that has, has or contemplated investing in a real estate syndication? If not, uh, anybody? A few people. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just give you uh, an opinion that I have, which is not, has not been accepted yet all over the place. 
And I'm, I'm going to use an example which everybody can understand. Usually the way these deals work, whatever you invest, you get 7 8% cash on cash. Uh, the, prom, the promotion is 30%, 40% that the promoter takes off of the profits, and then you get your, your share. So let's take an example. A guy wants to invest a million dollars, and he's looking for a deal which, let's, let's say, 7% cash on cash, so he's going to get $70,000 a year in distributions. So far, so good, right? The guy who's investing a million dollars in one deal, I assume it's not all his money, because again, you're not diversifying. What does he need the $70,000 for? What good is that going to do for him? So I'll give you an example. I believe that when people do syndications, they should rather go for a syndication that doesn't pay cash on cash. And let me tell you how it should be structured. It's more complicated. But let's take an investment they need $20 million in cash to go into the investment. If you put in a million dollars, you get 5% of the deal, correct? What? Yeah, you get 5% of the deal. By putting in the $20 million, the promoter figured out that he's going to be able to give you your distribution starting from year one. Even if there's, you lose a tenant or two, he still can give you your $70,000 a year. What happens is instead of giving the $70,000 a year or 7% of the $20 million is a million four, you only take investors for $15 million and you take a MES loan for $5 million. And the million four that you would have paid to the investors you're paying off most of it, you're paying off the MES loan in a five-year period, including the heavy interest. After the five-year period, what happened here? You put in your million dollars, you didn't get any distributions, but now you own 7% of the deal instead of 5% of the deal. Because remember, you're one out of 15 million, not one out of 20 million. And I did the math, you're much, much better off that way than getting your $70,000 a year. Uh, with, so when you talk about leverage, in this particular case I'm saying, it pays to leverage even more than you would normally leverage. You'd get, let's say, 80% from the bank, and you would get another 10% you would get from the Meslo. So just one more question, and then I think we turn it over to the audience. What, and this is to each of you, what was your biggest mistake in investing and what did you learn from it? Uh, my biggest mistake was uh, we're, all told, we're all told never to sell as something's going down, right? You buy low, you sell high. So that's what I learned throughout my career. My grandfather taught me. Uh, he was a Holocaust survivor. He loved looking at the market tables, talking about the stock market all, all the time. And uh, in 2008, 2009, I owned a lot of Lehman Brothers, and Lehman Brothers was going down like a sinking ship. And the U.S. government has ba bailed out Bear Stearns. Lehman Brothers is bigger, too big to fail. And I owned it, and I watched it, and I watched it drop, and I watched it drop, and I watched it drop from 90 to 50 to 70 to 60. To, just kept going. Uh, and it still sits in my portfolio at 0 .000.2 decimal points, right? It's unsellable. So whatever your market advice is, whatever happens, things do change, right? There's always a worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is losing your shirt. You can always lose your shirt. So know what the worst case scenario is, know what the risk factor is, decide whether you're comfortable with it, and then decide, right? We spoke about diversification, all these other factors, decide how your overall financial portfolio picture can handle that worst case scenario. But it's a great lesson, it's a great thing to have. It's a great thing to go through a bad cycle and a bad scenario. Let it affect you, but let it affect you in as much as it is a lesson learned, not as it's a behavioral restriction. Thanks for, thanks for going first. Um, so back to what Saul mentioned earlier, he mentioned in one phrase, stockbroker, financial advisor, different names, and threw them into one bucket. So I, I guess that's my biggest mistake, is I started my career as a stockbroker. I used to pitch individual stocks. We used to invest in individual stocks. 
even finan uh, professionally. I used to advise people to do that. And I was a stockbroker. I used to call clients like him and, oh, let's buy this, sell this. And it's a, it's a total different thing. So s stockbrokers generate commissions. They like trading. They like pitching different things. There's no plan behind it or very infrequently there's plan. They're getting incentivized to, to push uh, specific products by different companies, whether they're annuities or insurance companies that want to push things at, uh, at, at, uh, at the client and have the client buy. These days, and again, that, that was a mistake, spent a couple of years doing that, but you know, uh, currently we're, we're financial advisors, something called fiduciaries. A fiduciary being someone that has a legal obligation to do what's best for the client. We cannot be compensated by mutual fund companies, by insurance companies, by annuity companies to sell products. If there's a rebate that would normally go to us, it gets funded into the client's account. So we have a legal and an ethical and a proper obligation, not just like uh, Harav Nasha we mentioned earlier today from B&H saying that you, know, uh, you want to, you want to strive for it, you want to make sure you're on the same page with the clients, when the SEC is making sure of that too. So you're, you're, you're really incentivized to do that correctly. So that, I, 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 both, both of the mistake and, and really also the, the, the pitch of what we're doing now, making sure our, our, we have a full alignment of, of interest with our clients. Um, I think that, uh, that would answer both questions. Um, I'm not going to admit that, that it's my biggest mistake, but it's a mistake that I've made and other people make. Buying stocks on a good tip. Somebody comes over to you and says he has a good tip. This good tip can wind up in two ways. If it's really, really a good tip, you can get in trouble with the law. And if not, it's not a tip. So don't listen to anybody's tip. Anybody comes and knows what's going to be, if he knows it legally, he knows as much as you do. So the mistakes I made in the past, early on when we used to trade stocks, oh, I have a tip. I remember Asamara Oil, you probably never heard of that stock. That's going to double. By September 15th, it's going to double. Yeah. So while, while they're thinking about questions, I did want to say something. I know there's a couple of Dvar terrorists already today, but I do want to say something which I thought was, was important, and I hope uh, people will forgive me if they came for, for wealth management. The truth is it is. But I, I do want to say that the same way I, I just mentioned a fiduciary obligation to our clients, I think the Avisher gave each of us the, around this table money. It's, it's, it's not our own. The, Menashe mentioned before something about a shtadlus. If we learn Lubavitch Chassidus, especially from the Alter Rebbe and the Ar, so we, we, we know that his shtadlus could be even have a little bit of, 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 of a Vaidazar in it, believe it or not. If you think that you're a partner with the Abishter and it's not all the Abishter, and as much as what the Abishter gave us, it's literally all the Abishter, and he told us to make a Kli, so that's why we make a Kali. So we have a fiduciary obligation, all of us, to manage our money properly, not from an investment perspective, but to do the right things with the money. Stuck, uh, obviously, a uh, plug for, for CHYE, but I, I, I think if there's any, anything that we have to take away, it's not just about how to invest your money outside, but it's what to do the right things with your money from a tzedakah perspective, doing good things, helping other people. So that's why you guys are thinking about questions. I wanted to mention that, and it ties together also, I very good tie to with, with Purim, you know, why, why, why were the Yiddins, uh, well, the Gzera, why did it come about to have such a severe Gzera of Lahashmi Lahari Gizkala Yehudim? So again, the rabbi writes in the Sikhis, it has to do because they considered, okay, this is a Shtadlos, let's go to Achashverish. You know, again, it's a method of, of, of accomplishing what they needed to accomplish. But because there's a little bit of, of a vak, of a desire there, it's, it's really, so it's, it's understanding this and really saying, look, whatever you have, whatever you have, it wasn't you, and, and doing the right things with it, because what David Sher is going to want with it, so I'll throw that in. How do you deal with stress? Why, is your name the son of Gans? <laughs> Very good. What? So it's exactly what I just said. I just answered how you deal with stress. Not you, the David Sher. No Ishtadlos, make your plea. What are you stressing about? 
I play ice hockey twice a week. If I don't do it, then I'm stressed. If I do it, then I'm having fun. You have to live some life for yourself, right? Everybody here works hard. A lot of the people here are business owners. Business owners mean you're working for your business and you're working for yourself. If you don't take time out for what you're doing, then you're going to be stressed. So it's either mishpacha, family, your own time, or whatever that means to you. But it's got to be your why and what you need to do. That's for me. I can tell you how a former president of the United States when he was asked the same question. Lyndon Johnson was president. They asked him, Mr. President, uh, the Vietnam War was starting then, or in the middle. Mr. President, how do you take stress? You know what he answered? He said, son, I don't take stress. I give stress. So, I believe the um, topic was build your wealth. And I believe that some in this room are still starting out in life. And my question to each one of you is, what is your suggestion to them on how to build their wealth and where to start? Not about, not about five years or ten years down the road where some are, but a lot of young guys have to start somewhere. And they don't necessarily have the advice or the knowledge of where to start, and they hear the pie in the skies, you know, like you said, invest in this stock or whatever, get the tip or whatever. Where should they start? They're starting their life, mishpacha and everything. Where do they need to start? Retirement funds and everything else that exists with that. Where would each Arla and uh, Mr. I forgot. And, 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 and Mr. Friedman, each one of you guys, where would you guys um, uh, give a suggestion to those still in the room of where to start and those listening online, where to start? Um, interestingly enough, I mean, Baruch Hashem, I have Einiklech, probably your age. I don't know your age. Uh, Einiklech, who asked me? Well, how much? 25. You're 25. I have Einiklech older than you. Anyway, uh, they asked me that same question. Some of them are still in Lakewood in, in Kolo. Some have started working. You know what I tell them? Go to a financial advisor or wealth manager, open up an account, and start by putting in $200 a month, $300 a month, whatever you can afford, $500 a month. And they'll, re and they'll respond, Zaidi, I tried, but the wealth manager has, uh, has a $100,000 minimum or a half a million dollar minimum. So you go to the Reuven. But well, that's what most would respond. Well, let me tell you why it's not true. Uh, I have Einiklech, I have Baruch Hashem Ir Einiklech. For each of the kids, I opened an account. That's, that's, beca that's because I you have, have the financial advisor no, in the relationship. Well, no, 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 with small amounts of money when they get born. Some of them are 35, 33 years old, okay? So they can afford the financial advisor that I use. They send me a statement, I beg them not to send it, I, I want to get it. It's uh, probably, it's this fast. 75 accounts. Some have, uh, you know, I put the poor money in there and slowly and slowly, you have to start. Once you have an account, okay, you have extra, you find a wealth manager or you go to a Fidelity or you go to a Schwab where you can automatically do it. Believe me, once you have this account, even if there's a thousand dollars in it, you're always going to say, you know, I have an extra $500 extra, let me put it into the account. I learned this from my father, Lava Shalom. We were very poor when we grew up. I remember to this day, we lived in the Lower East Side. On top of the refrigerator, whatever it was called, an icebox in those days, he had a cup. There wasn't plastic cups then. It probably was a, I don't know, a cup, a glass. And every time he had spare change, a nickel, a dime, a quarter, he had spare change, he threw it into this cup. Came Hanukkah time, when it was his anniversary, he took the cup, emptied the thing, counted up, and bought my mother a gift. He said, always said to me, I can't afford to spend $5 for a gift. Where am I going to get $5 from? But you put in a nickel here and a quarter here, it adds up to 5 or $10, and that's what he used for gifts. Right, so, so if you want to start out, Start out with a small account. That's it. Right, so of course I wasn't, I wasn't arguing with that advice. Of course, it's starting as soon as you can. 
But you, to, to, to think that you're going to have a financial advisor, again, Ruben says he, he, he is zero minimums. But most financial advisors, again, get paid on the assets that they manage, and it's just financially almost impossible to, to deal with. So the answer is a robo-advisor or a Fidelity or a Schwab, an online account, and you set up the account and you start today. And the benefit of compounding is, it's, it's unbelievable. Actually, my partner Yanki, before I was asking any interesting tidbits I should share, and he told me, who do you think the greatest investor is all time? Investors, so it's not the rule, you know, Elon Musk is not an investor. Who's the, the most successful investor? Buffett, very good, Ari, Buffett. Why is he the best investor? Look at his returns. His, his average return is not anywhere close to the top quartile, of, the top decile of investors. I think he mentioned Jim Simons, there's other investors, even as Engl Englander. You have investors that are doing a lot better than him on a percentage basis. It's just he started in the 50s or even 40s, and he's still kicking today. So the benefit of compounding is what it does. If he did 30% instead of 20% like some investors, or 50% like Simons does, and he did that over his time frame, he would have literally trillions and trillions of dollars. So it's all about compounding, the benefit of putting money today and doing it on an automated basis, every single month going out of your check, and not into a life insurance scam, into real investments, a real proper portfolio, don't look higher, lower, automatic transfer of wealth from your account to your brokerage account. Obviously, that's, that's, that's the way to start. So I, I have a little riddle that I like to ask people on the benefits of compounding. Supposing you took one penny, one single penny, you put it into Chase Manhattan Bank that pays 6% interest compounded annually, and you leave that penny in the account for a thousand years. How much money do you think you're going to have after the end of a thousand years on that penny compounding? Anyway, you can figure it out mathematically, which I did. If you take all the money in the planet Earth today, every, every dollar that's been, dollars, euros, everything, you couldn't pay that account. That's how compounding. It compounds 80... 80 or over 80 times. So if you take a penny, compound it over 80 times, it comes in the gazillions of dollars. Putting the math aside, right? Putting it all aside, right? Why do we work with clients who have no minimum? Why do we feel that's really important to do that? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? So it starts with you, right? Do you believe in you? What are you doing for you? You're not going to be found. Nobody's going to say, what's your name? Again, right, I'm going to work with Vinyam because he's smarter than that stuff. You're not an NBA player. We're not a super talented athlete. But the first thing is finding yourself, right? Betting on yourself. The long shot in the time, right? Doing whatever you need to do to play your own and whatever that looks like. Once you have that, you start to build your wealth. Your money needs a job. Our smartest client is uh, a young girl from California, an African-American woman. She grew up on the streets, right? And the first thing she said, she's got a massive bonus from her law firm. For her, it was massive. And she looked at myself and the other advisor and she said, I got this bonus. The money needs a job, right? So once you have a job, your money can have a job. For video purposes. But your money can only have a job once you have a job. So why do we work with clients with no minimum? Because we work with people who believe in themselves. Once you believe in yourselves, we can IPO with the client. The client is the underlying investment. Right? You're going to grow from zero to something once you believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, your financial advisor should believe in you to say, hey, we can only wait till you have $100,000, $200,000. Maybe that's the business model, which is fine. But that's why technology is wonderful. He asked about Betterment. We'll work with Betterment. We'll work with any robo we have to, as long as we're getting a client on a road to financial success that was started by you, but our job is to give your money a, jo a job to support you. No, you can sit over there. I'll sit over there. But the reason why I asked the question was for 18 years, I do residential mortgages. And. It, what? Whatever, you know. And in the 18 years, something that I've noticed a lot is wealth building that does not exist in the firm community. A lot of people do not have the ability or do not do what needs to be done to create that wealth building that when they want to buy the house, they want to do all these things. And so I ask to the panelists and I say, 
how much more information, how much more you can give to everybody that you talk to, whether it's just advice or helping them grow that and tell them what, what they need to do. It's as like you said, but it's important that it happens on a daily basis. So it starts with education. Benjamin, thank you. It starts with education. So you're educating. No, you're helping with the education. Um, to, to everybody to understand the benefit of compounding, the benefit of putting away, even it, it just starting the account, like Saul mentioned, putting $100 every month. Again, money that they can afford and skip that coffee every day or skip the, you know, the Starbucks or, or whatever it is. And that people should be in that state. I also think there's education that needs to be done for from companies offering 401k plans, offering incentives, matchings to their 401k participants. 6% like Wells Fargo gives. So no, so, th so those are other things where business owners should help incentivize that when that person retires at 65 or 70 years old, you know, wh what are they left with? Now they don't have the ability to work because they're in incapable for whatever reason it is or they can't find another job after they needed to be let go for someone younger and now they're left with nothing. So the, there's education that's for sure needed and we're trying to be build awareness. It's one of uh, the things that Equinim as a firm is, is uh, intending and intends to, to build on. Great answer, great question. Uh, those of you left, let's give a round of applause to our three panelists. Thank you very much. I hope you learned a Thank lot. Thank you, Ari. Have a good night. Come on, do the mic drop. Come on, Ari, come on.